Amen. First Peter chapter 1, we will be reading from verse, beginning on verse 1. And tonight I'm starting a preaching series on why God saved us. Why God saved you. What is the purpose of our salvation? Why you are here? Why are you serving the Lord? What is the reason why we belong? We are part of His flock. We are His precious sheep. So this is what we're going to be studying on the next, this Sunday, the other Sunday, and probably the other Sunday as the Lord leads us. First Peter chapter 1 verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontius Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling of His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. In this you rejoice through now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by very trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perish through is tested by fire, may be found a result in praise and glory and honor and the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us this passage, the Apostle Peter, he is addressing the converted Jews who were dispersed. The history reveals to us that when the Roman Empire invaded Israel, invaded Jerusalem, the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. And scripture also reveals to us that the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Israel, it was a prophecy from Jesus Christ. When Jesus entered in Jerusalem, before he went into that city, he cried and he said, Whoa, Jerusalem, you that kills the prophets that were sent to you. He enters there. He is received as a king. But one week later, he was at the cross, crucified by the hands of that very people who received him in the beginning. Jerusalem now was destroyed and Peter writes to those who belong to the people of Israel, but now they are part of the church of Jesus Christ because they became one in Christ Jesus by repenting and believing in His name. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells us that He identifies with them. That's what the Bible says on verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, He is identifying himself with his writers. He is speaking to them, we have something in common. We are here this night because we have something in common. We are part of the same family in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your family, where you came from. We are one in Christ Jesus. When we repent and believe in his name, we belong to his body, the body of Christ, we belong to his holy and precious church. So the apostle Peter, he's identifying with his disciples, with those he is writing this epistle. And I can tell you, we are all here because we have something in common. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can say to the person close to you, we have something in common. Hallelujah. We have something in common. Hallelujah. Yes, we do. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? <laughs> Hallelujah. 
we have something in common. And what we have in common is that we believe in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. This is what we have in common. We believe only in Christ for our salvation. This is what we have in common. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your family. What matters is if you believe in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And what the Apostle Peter is also saying in this first verse, in, in verse 1, when he's using this expression elected, he's writing to the elect people. He's saying to me and you that salvation starts with God. Hallelujah. Salvation starts with God. Elected. This is the same word that the Bible uses. If you read in the book of Ephesians, it's talking about predestination. That before the foundations of the world, God knew you. God had a plan for your life. God had a plan for you. Before you were ever born, before you were in the womb of your mother, God knew you. God had a plan for your life. Hallelujah. We can rejoice in this. Elected before the foundation of the world. And when came the appropriate time, what happened? God called you. You were chosen by God. He, he knew you before you, were, you ever existed. And the appropriate time, He called you. Where can we find this in this scripture, Reverend? It says on verse 2, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit. You know, there was the Holy Spirit that convicted you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No one can be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why the church needs the Word and the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And I can tell we are a church of the Word and the Spirit. We are preaching the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because only the Holy Spirit can convict someone to salvation. Only the Holy Spirit can transform someone's heart. Hallelujah. It's not about how eloquent you are. If you have dominion of the words, if you can speak very nice, that doesn't make a difference. You can be the best speaker in this whole country and nothing will happen if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that in the appropriate time, God the Father has called us. He foreknew us. But he called us in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ in the sprinkling of his blood. So the day that God called you, the day that the Holy Spirit convicts you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And now he became everything to you. He became your all and more. Hallelujah. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, I and the Father, and He will convict this world from sin, righteousness, and judgment. And how does the Holy Spirit do that? He does that by the work of the church. When the church proclaims the gospel, when the church announces the, the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit follows working on people's hearts and bringing them to repentance. Hallelujah. In the appropriate time, God called you the sanctification of the Spirit to the obedience of Jesus. And what happened? You obeyed the Lord by repenting and believing in Him. You recognized that you were a sinner, that you could not save yourself, that you depended on God. And that moment you surrender your life to Jesus. That is true conversion. Unfortunately, many churches today... They are so much focused on trying to get numbers that call everyone in the front and everyone raises their hand. And many people who raises their hand, they never repented. They didn't actually believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because conversion is not a matter of raising my hand. Conversion is a matter of your spirit being revived by the Spirit of God. Is your heart being transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. People can look to your life and see that there's something different. They will look and they will see the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life. Hallelujah. Even if that person struggles with addiction, even if that person still struggle with sin, but when they came to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is working in their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This Holy Spirit called us and He sanctified us because now we are part of the body of Christ. And we repented and believed in Jesus Christ. We obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle, he's, he's excited, and, I, and I'm excited. When I read this word, I'm excited. Blessed be God, <laughs> and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, when you understand the depthness of the doctrine of salvation, it creates in you a grateful heart. Someone that understand what Christ has done for them, they cannot continue to be an ungrateful person. Your life is now to rejoice that now your sins are forgiven. That now God has called you out of darkness to eternal light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The moment that you know what Christ has done for you, you are able to every morning wake up and say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what are the reasons? What are the reasons to be grateful? Hmm. It says that according to His great mercy. Say with me, great mercy. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now raise the questions. The question is, how God saved us? How did it happen? The Bible says that it was according to his great mercy. Glory to God. Glory to God. It is not a question of merit. It's not a matter of how good you were. How good you are. That's actually the lie of the devil in this century. People think they don't need God. They boast themselves going around saying, I'm a good person. Jesus said, there's no good but God. <laughs> Jesus was very clear on that. There's no one good but God. We are all sinners. We all fall astray from God's glory. The Bible says that we were saved not because I'm a good person. Not because I decided to follow Jesus. No. He chose you. And He called you. And He brought you with His loving arms. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes we have to confront some stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Let's stay with the Word of God according to His Great mercy. His great mercy. We are all, we were all dead in our sins. We were all under God's wrath and condemnation. When we talk about spirit, spiritual death, there was no way that you could come to God unless God bring you, brought you. There was no way. This is what is known in biblical doctrine as total deprivation. Since Adam and Eve, since the beginning of this world, since the fall, there is no way that man can decide by themselves to follow God unless God gives them eternal life. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When they hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit works in their heart and gives them eternal life. That's what happened to you. That's what happened to me. The Lord convinced you. And how did, you, how did he convince you? First, he gave you spiritual life. You were dead. Now you're alive. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
But the Bible says that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the only solution was for you to be saved that God needed to create you again. You needed to become a new creation. There was no solution for us. We were dead. And the Bible says that he brought us back to life. We were born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He caused us to be born again for what? To a living hope. Repeat, repeat with me. Living hope. Hallelujah. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. Hope. And when you read the scripture using the words blessed hope or hope, this is referring to an event that the church awaits. It's talking about an occasion that it can happen at any moment. And that is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the blessed hope. He can come at any time. We, there is a big possibility that we don't finish this service tonight. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9 and 10, it says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. And how you turn to God from the idols to serve the living God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who deliver us from the wrath to come. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm not waiting the Antichrist. <clears throat> I'm not waiting the beast. I'm not waiting the false prophet. <laughs> I'm waiting my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's who I'm waiting. I'm waiting the Lord. And when he come with shout of acclamation, he will take us home. Jesus said, I'm going, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will come back again. And I will take you home with me. So wherever I am, you may be also. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the living hope. He brought us back to life from death to a living hope. So now we live a life of expectation. At any moment, the Lord can come. At any moment, we will meet Him in the clouds. We will be with Him forever. We are not waiting the Antichrist. We are not waiting the, the false prophet and the beast. We are waiting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. He made me alive spiritually. He caused me to be born again to live in a living hope. Why it's a living hope? Because he is alive. Hallelujah. He is seated in the right hand of the Father. He is not dead. It's not a dead hope. Our hope is, is a living hope. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The question is, why God saved you? And this night I want to talk about one aspect of the purpose of our salvation. And we're going to be talking many more aspects. There are many reasons, there are many purposes why God saved you. But tonight I want to speak to you about we are saved to love God. We are saved to walk in God's love. Let's go back. First Peter chapter 1, it says on verse 5, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. Who is the one that guards us? Is the Lord. He's the one that called us. He's the one that has chosen us. And he's the one that will keep us to the end. 
But if we go back to verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. Hallelujah. I have an inheritance. You have an inheritance that is imperishable. Hallelujah. Undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Hallelujah. There is an inheritance for us. He has prepared a place for us. And the Bible says on verse 5, Who by God's power, not by your might, not by your strength, but by the power of God, we are being guarded. You can say that in your heart. You can declare this every day in your life. I am being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. God is guarding me. God is protecting you. He's the one that will keep us. As you put your trust in Him, He's the one that will keep you. He will keep you to the end. And now, what is the result of this? Verse 5. In this you rejoice. Hallelujah. How does people rejoice when they go to the stadium? When they watch Middlesbrough playing and Middlesbrough finally wins the game. What happens? <laughs> but thank God the Christian has a reason to rejoice every day. We have a reason to rejoice every day. You know what? Because we are more than conquerors through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Every day we have a reason to rejoice. Because He has made us, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And now He gave us an, an, what the Bible says, an inheritance that is imperishable. This belongs to us. This is who we are in Christ Jesus. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice through now for a while, if necessary. You have been grieved, grieved by various trials. This is the life of the Christian. We go through persecution. We go through difficulties. But in the middle of difficulties and trials, we are able to rejoice in God. Hallelujah. And many of you here this night are witnesses of, of this. We can rejoice in God. In the middle of the trials. You know what? Because when you know the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> no one can take that knowledge from you. When you know God, when you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you know what He has done for you on the cross, when you know that the work of the Holy Spirit inside you gave you life, gave you spiritual life, will guard you to the end, no one can take that out of you. They can take our building, they can imprison us, they can do whatever they want. But one thing, they cannot take your assurance that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They can do whatever they want. We can go through trials and persecution and difficulties. But we are able to rejoice. Because there is an inheritance kept for us in heaven. Hallelujah. And this you rejoice through now for a little while if necessary. The Bible says even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I shall not fear. You know, we can go through the valley. I'm not living in the valley. I'm not staying in the valley. I'm passing in the valley. I'm going to the green pastures. But even when I pass through this valley, I know that the Lord is with me. And He is indeed with those who trust in His Word. It says on verse 7, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through the tested by fire may be found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when the Lord comes, when He returns, 
our faith is imperishable before him. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 8. We haven't seen him. None of us here have ever seen Jesus Christ physically resurrected in front of us. We haven't seen him. He is seated now at the right hand of the Father. But one thing we can be sure. We love him. How is that? We're not talking about a human love. Because how can you love someone you've never seen? We're not talking about a love that can be understood by human explanation. Someone that lived, died, and rose again 2,000 years ago. How does that affect my life? I've never seen this man. You've never seen him, but you love him. Let's open our Bibles, 1 John chapter 4. Let me show you something. 1 John, right at the end of the Bible, chapter 4, verse 19. Why do we love him if we never seen him? We love him because he loved us first. Hallelujah. That's the reason why we love him. Because he loved us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read from verse 1 to 6. And it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God... Being rich in mercy. Hallelujah. Because of the great love. Say it with me. Great love. Great. Say it again. Great love. Great. Say it again. Great love. Great. Hallelujah. Because of the great love which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace. You have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He loved us before the foundation of the world. This is not a love based on what you see. And this great love of God, this agape love of God, unconditional love. Let's open our Bibles. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 verse 5. It says. And hope does not put us to shame. This world tried to shame the Christians. Isn't it? Mocking the Christians. That's what they do. That's what they do on television. That's what they do all the time. When we go on the streets to preach the gospel. People mock. They mock at us. They laugh at us. You know what? I don't care. Because this hope does not put me to shame. Because this world will be ashamed when the Lord come in the clouds descending and bringing judgment to this world. They will be ashamed when they have to face the final judgments of God. True hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love. You know this love, this great love that he loved you before the foundation of the world? God's love has been poured 
into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to you. So Christians, they need to stop praying, Lord, give me more love. No, no, no. He has poured into your heart already the love of God. What should I do now, Pastor? You walk in love. Because this love has been poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. Because He lives in you. And He will be with you till the end of the ages. Glory to God. We have the love of God in our hearts. You have the love of God in your heart. But now, how do I demonstrate this love? And I want to show you two ways. First, we love God by loving His Word. Let's open the Bible. John chapter 14. Gospel of John chapter 14. The Bible says on verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Hmm. You know, when we preach the truth of God, people say, oh, this is harsh. This is a harsh language. You know what? I want the Holy Ghost language. Jesus preached the truth, and the truth of God is God revealing his love toward us. When we preach the truth to sinners out in the world, what we are showing, we're showing the love of God so that they can escape the final judgment that is coming. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, it's not by going out, oh, I love Jesus. Wearing out a clothing or a t-shirt, I love Jesus. That doesn't change you. People have many Christian t-shirts out there. You can, you can <laughs> open a business of Christian t-shirts and still not love God. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And what happens? And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make a home within him. How can we know? If this love is functioning in our lives, he has poured out this love in our, in our lives, in our heart. Now, how do I love God? First, by loving His Word. We need to prioritize the Word of God. You know, what is the, the most valuable thing you have in your life is one thing called time. Because you cannot buy it. Actually, this world is buying your time every day. That's why you go to work. You are exchanging your time in order for some money to live. Because your time is the most valuable thing. And what the devil has done today is that we are so much focused on entertainment that we don't have time anymore for the Word of God. We don't prioritize the Word of God. You eat three, four times a day, but you make only one spiritual meal a week and expect to be strong in the faith. Keep my word. Let's go to 1 John. Go to the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter... 2 verse 5. Verse 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. If the truth of God is perfected in us, if we keep His word. How do we demonstrate our love to God? First, we love God by loving His word. And we love God by loving our neighbor. 1 John chapter 4, just turn to chapter 4. Verse 6 to verse 10, it says, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and 
the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. But you know what the devil has spread out in this world? The lie that love is a feeling. That you feel love towards someone. What is love? It's a famous song, isn't it? What is love? <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. What is love? God is love. This world doesn't know what is love. If you don't know God, you don't know true love. God is love. How, how can I love God? By loving His Word and loving my neighbor. And how do you demonstrate love? By two ways. By your words and your actions. How can you love your neighbor? Through your words and your actions. Hallelujah. But the Bible tells us that we need to love even our enemies. How can we do that? Is that possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how. Because the love of God, not our love. Because your love, you have towards your friends, towards your family. You don't need the love of God to love someone who, who treats you well, who's part of your life, who, who, has, who gives meaning to your life. But when someone lies about you, persecute you, try to cause damage in your life, how can you love them? With God's love. You can forgive because Christ has forgiven you. You can love, Jesus said, that we love our enemies by praying for them. It's not going there and hugging and kissing them. No, no, no none of that. You go and you love them by praying for them so that God would have mercy on them, so that God would transform their hearts. That's how we love our enemies. Hallelujah. God saved you so that now you're called to walk in His love. And we are saved to love God. And how do I love God? I love God by loving His Word, and I love God by loving others. Every Christian was, must walk in love. Because if you don't walk in love, your faith will not operate. Your faith is inefficient. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So, if you don't walk in love, your faith won't work. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. How can I walk according to God's will? By walking in love. My conclusion is, can you recognize God's love in your salvation. It started with God by Him loving you before the foundation of the world. Thank God that we are kept in His love. I want to finish by giving you just another assurance from Scripture. We go through difficulties in our lives and we are tempted by our flesh we are tempted by the devil in circumstances to doubt. Because, Lord, if you truly love me, why I'm going through all this? Why am I living this situation? We go through such dark times in our lives that we are tempted to question his love. I can be, it looks like I'm far from his love. But 
the answer from God to us is on verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? God is asking us, who shall separate us from the love of God? Hmm. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. You know, the early Christians, they were being killed under enormous persecution. And the Christians in this country need to start getting ready because we will be persecuted in this country for standing for the truth of God. Those who don't compromise the truth of God, they will be persecuted in this place. I can tell you, you be assured of this. But one thing we can also be assured, that even if we are like sheep sent to the slaughterhouse, one thing we know, who can separate us from the love of God? What? Is it any of these circumstances? No. Verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Glory to God. Through Him who loved us. Through Jesus Christ, we overcome all these situations. For I am sure. Amazing when Paul uses this expression. He doesn't use very often. He says, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything in presence or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God saved us. He called us by His love so that we may walk in love because God is love. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord.